Our concentration today is that fathers are the watchers of the doors. In our practical understanding of that, we're going to broaden it this evening to consider the whole concept of each of us as individuals and the doors of our lives. And notice particularly the unguarded doors. It was God who said through the wise man in Proverbs 4, Guard your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. It is an absolute fact that we live in a world now for sure, but it's always been the case, that we must be people who guard the doors of our lives. And not guarding them uh, creates a real problem for our spiritual lives. This morning we notice that fathers are the responsible ones to guard, to watch over their homes. They are the watchers of the doors. But they don't have the responsibility only in themselves. Every one of us has that job as an individual to be the watcher of our own doors in order to guard ourselves because out of us, out of that heart, come the issues of life. This text from John 10 helps us understand that Jesus is the door. And he uses that terminology, I think, obviously, intentionally. <clears throat> and I'm supposed to understand the intentional use of the word door. And I want to think what this text tells us about unguarded doors. First of all, Jesus said in the text <clears throat> that he is the door. All who came before him were robbers and thieves. Twice he mentions the robbers and the thieves. Now as I understand it, <clears throat> at least in the Bible times, the door of the sheepfold really was the shepherd. My understanding is that at night when the sheep would be corralled, it was the shepherd who lay down at the opening of the sheepfold as a guard. Not only is it the case that he kept the sheep in, but he kept everything else out. And you remember when David wanted to fight Goliath, and the reason he gave for it was the fact that he, as a shepherd, twice had guarded his sheep. Once from a lion, once from a bear. The figure then of the shepherd guarding the sheep, the shepherd being the door that guards the sheep, is a powerful concept. Think with me why the shepherd needs to be there. What is the danger that causes us to need to guard our doors? Now, there are a lot of things we could talk about, but I'm talking about us. I'm talking about those of us who assemble together, those of us who are God's children, those of us who claim to be in a relationship with God. I'm talking about us. I'm talking about the people of the world. So when I hear, when I talk about or mention these dangers for us, yes, I think they are dangers for Christians, therefore we need to guard our doors from these. For instance, our doors need to be guarded. And I know that we are in danger every time we don't care when we are in apathy. There are times when we just don't care. We get tired. How many times have you yourself or have you heard of Christians who have worked 
and worked and worked. They pushed, they prodded, they pleaded. And they cannot get any help. And the Christian says, that's it. I don't care anymore. I understand it. You probably understand it. There comes a time when we have just had it up to here, and I just don't care anymore. That mentality, that moment, that situation is a dangerous situation for Christians who are trying to guard their doors. Yes, there are frustrations in life. There are frustrations in all of our relationships, not the least of which would be our brethren. But those frustrations that put us in a momentary situation where we say, I've had enough, I don't care anymore. That's a dangerous time. Here's another dangerous time when a Christian says, I don't know. I just don't know. That's dangerous. Now, what I mean by that, there, there is nothing wrong with being ignorant. We, we use that term as though the word itself is a derogatory term. You're just an ignorant person. Well, it's not necessarily derogatory in, in its definition. The definition is they don't know. Well, does it mean that a, a child... Is it, a, is it a, something that we say to a child in a negative way? says, you're ignorant when they've never been taught something? Why no? They're ignorant because they've not been taught. So I'm not saying that being ignorant or not knowing is necessarily a problem. It's not the momentary situational ignorance. It's that continuing ignorance of God's Word that becomes a problem. It's a dangerous thing. How many times? Have you said, I don't know that answer? And how many times have you tried to find it? The problem is not right now, I don't know. The problem is, next week, next year, I still don't know. That's a problem. That's a dangerous point at which our doors have then become unguarded. Here's another one, third. Our doors unguarded, we are in danger when we begin to love the freedom of the unguarded door. Worldliness is an issue that every one of us struggles with. Every one of us struggles with the idea of worldliness in some form and in some fashion. But there are Christian people who begin to dabble in the world, and they like it. Well, you don't dabble in something you despise. You're not tempted by things that you don't enjoy. So I get it. But the one who continues to dabble and begins to enjoy that, enjoying it and preferring it and saying, I don't like the shackles of the door of Jesus. How many times have you known of people who leave home and throw off all restraint because now they think, hey, the boundaries are down, and I can do whatever I want to do. To say that I'm drawn to the world is one thing, because we're all fighting it. But to go and live and dabble and participate in a way that helps me become connected to the world, that's a point of danger. It doesn't matter what that thing is. I know a man who, for those of us who golf, he was a preacher, and he was a scratch golfer. That means every time he went out, he basically shot par. 
he quit golf because he said, I began to love it more than the rest of my life. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I only hope that I one day can give up golf because I'm a scratch golfer. It hasn't happened, and I don't see it in my future. But worldliness is a point of danger. How about this point of danger? Saying, I need to guard my door when I say, well, yes, but I'm not ready yet. I'll do it later. I'll do it later. What about Felix? who after hearing the gospel message from Paul said, go away. When I have a convenient time, I'll call for you. Did he ever? I don't know. Did he ever? Did he wait too long? Did he intend to? Maybe? Probably? But he didn't. How long can we procrastinate guarding our lives until we won't want to guard them? When I have the attitude that says, yes, I know this is an issue. Yes, I know this is a problem. Yes, I know I need to do this, but I'm not ready now. That is a point of danger that says... There might be a thief and a robber just about to step in, finally. Another danger point that we suffer from from time to time, spiritual arrogance. When I get to the point of thinking I've arrived, I have all the answers, and I don't need any more. And not only that, I have your answers and all you have to do is listen to me, and I will give you all the right answers. Sure, we need to be people who are confident in our Christianity. But spiritual arrogance is a point of danger that says, my doors are not being guarded well. There's a danger out there. It says, you better start guarding your doors. Because number two, if you don't, there's going to be some damage. Jesus said, these thieves and robbers, when they come, they're coming here to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I've never really figured out why he said those three things. I get the steal, take your stuff. I get the kill, but what is the destroy being the third one? Is it worse than killing? Probably. The idea is they want to totally annihilate, want to take it all away. The damage is when I don't have my doors guarded that I will lose my relationship with the Lord. Here's the damage. The damage is from losing everything when you've gone after everything. Losing everything when everything you have is then gone. But you didn't go after the one thing that matters. What did Jesus say? about the man who loves the world, gets everything, but loses his own soul. The damage is, I went after everything this world had, but then you lose everything, and you have nothing left. The damage is, like the prodigal son, Luke 15, who 
wasted all of his substance with riotous living. He spent everything he had. He bought everything he wanted, but he bought nothing that he needed. How much investment are we making in the things that we need? What investments are we making in the things that we need? I know the investments we make in the things that we want, but what about the things we need? That was the problem with the prodigal. He bought everything he wanted, but apparently he bought nothing that he needed. Or how about Jesus in Luke 6 and verse 49? It's a different rendering of his wise man parable at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. In Luke, he records it this way. This is the man who built his house on the ground, and the waves came and washed it away. He built it on the ground. He thought that it was a good foundation. He thought it was good, but in fact it was not. The damage comes when I have built my whole life on a foundation that I thought would work, and then to see it crumble right before my eyes. What am I trying to build? Am I building something that will survive into eternity, guarding the doors. The dangers are out there, and the damage is eternal. So what about the discipline of guarding the door? Jesus said, I am the door. Anyone who comes in by me will be saved. And he will go in and out and find pasture. That's the first thing he said, I am the door. He then would go on to say, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Let me give you three things about the doors. Three things of the discipline of the door. Number one, know what you believe. 1 John 4, 3, verse 19. By this we shall assure our hearts in truth, John said. Know what you believe. One of the doors that we need to put into our lives is a knowledge of what I know or the faith that I have in God. How many children are we raising merely to have their parents' faith and not their own? The problem is that we need not only to teach them the faith, but we need to teach them their personal faith. Know what you believe. Understand what you know to be true. The greatest door that we can put in our lives to begin is to have this word in our hearts, to be able to turn to it and use it and say, this is what I believe. The class I'm teaching on Sunday morning, the, we, we decided to have a class on the pattern principle. And the point we made this morning was that we need to know. We need to know why it is that we're doing what we're doing. Why am I here? Why do we do the things we do? Why do we teach the things we teach? I need to know. It's not enough to say, go ask the preacher. Go ask an elder. I need to know. Number two, I need to defend what I know. 
1 Peter 3 and verse 15, Peter said, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to anyone who asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Not only do I need to know what I believe, but I need to be able to defend what I believe. I need to be able to, to share what I believe. I need to be able to confront others with what I believe. It's one thing to put up a door, put a lock on it. It's another thing to put a second lock and a security camera. It just does more enforcing of the security. I know what I believe, but when I turn and defend it with someone else, that just ensures that I know it even better. I've heard students who participate in Lads to Leaders debate. Here's what's interesting about the debate at Lads to Leaders. When you debate, whatever the proposition is, and it's all the standard ones you would think that we would have controversial topics about, whether it be women preachers, uh, elders in the church, instrumental music, whatever it is, they debate it. Homosexual marriage, to debate at last the leaders, they have to debate both sides. They have to research and understand what is it that these people are saying that I don't agree with and be able to present it as one side of the argument. And then over here, they have to present what the biblical view is. There is value in understanding <clears throat> what others teach on things and how they teach it so that I can then take Scripture and say, well, this is what God teaches. When I defend what I know, I know better what I have defended. But third, know the one that we can trust and be in a relationship with. Jesus said, I am the door. He said, first, if you enter through me, you'll be saved. If you're not a child of God, if you've not been baptized into Jesus, if you know that you have a relationship with the world in a way that others have a relationship with God, meaning this is your residence in the world versus those who have a residence in the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean that you're a mean and nasty and ugly person. It doesn't mean that you've created terrible, awful sins. What it means is you're not a child of God. That's all it means. I know that most of us who obeyed the gospel when we were quite young. I know we have sinned worse after baptism than we did before we were baptized. I know it because I hear it all the time and I live with it. So, but the idea is that when you become a Christian, it's not about because I've been such a terrible and awful person. It's about one thing. I am not in the family of God. That's what it is. So Jesus said, you come in by me and you'll be saved. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus by being in his family, your door is not guarded. Your life is wide open. The devil is available to come to you much more easily. You know what? He might even be telling you to wait. He might even be comfortable with who you are. He may not even be tempting you very much. You know why? He's got you. He doesn't need to bother you too much. Jesus said, number two, if you are in a saved relationship with me, you can go in and out. I've wondered about that term, in and out. You know what I think he's saying? I think he's saying, when you're in a relationship with me, you can interact with the world 
and you're safe. You can go to work. You can go to play. You can have relationships. But your relationship with Jesus goes with you to those venues. You go in and out, and you'll be okay. Without a relationship with Jesus, you're already caught. You'll go in and out and find pasture. To find pasture means to get what I need to survive. With Jesus, he promised that all these things will be added to you. Food, clothing, and shelter, he talked about in Matthew 6. If you seek the kingdom of God first. So having a relationship with Jesus is the greatest door that you can put in your life. But then there's that final thing he said. I want you to have life and have it abundantly. You know what abundant living is? It's living in HD or LED. It's living in QLED. Where does it end, by the way? Somebody tell me. Every time you turn around, they have another television talking about how great this is. I had a lady, a a guy who put in a system for me years ago, and he said, I have just come from a lady's house that I a week ago installed HD Direct TV. And this week she called me to take it out. And she loves baseball. That's why she wanted it. And he said, I couldn't understand it. I said, ma'am. Why are you wanting to have me cut it off? And she said, I love baseball. But I don't love seeing sweat beads on their face. That's what she said. There's too much detail. She didn't want to see all that. So she returned to the other picture just to enjoy the baseball. I want to know, where is it going to end? Where is it going to end? What are we up to? 5G in telephone service now? Is it going higher? Will there be a 10? Will there be a 20? You know, what does that mean? I don't know. But I know this, that's abundant living spiritually. When you know God, when you have a relationship with Him, and you have a relationship with people who have a relationship with Him, that's abundant living. Yes, I'm a little hyped, having gone to the Diana singing on Friday night. There's just something special about being in an environment with 3,000 people. And by and large, the general idea is you have something in common with those people because we're all children of God. And we just sit there and sing. We sat and sang from about 7.30 to 2 a.m., We left and they were still singing. There's something special about that. That's abundant living. The relationships we have with God and God's people. Unguarded doors. We've seen the danger to require them. The damage that comes from not having it. And the discipline we need to guard the doors. Are you ready to guard your door tonight? If you haven't. We're here to help you if you'll come as we stand and sing.